Hi, everyone. Um, today, I'm delighted and honored to welcome Anton Volovic, who is co-CEO at Reface, a company that built a robust application for syndicated content creation. Anton, thank you so much for making the time to join us today. It's a great pleasure to welcome you. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for this opportunity. I would be super happy to tell you a bit about myself and Reface. First of uh, all, well, uh, you know, like huge congrats on your new role at Reface. You have recently stepped in as a co-CEO. I know that you you had this incredible success uh, in your career path since you joined Reface. You joined as a chief business officer, uh, moved to CEO position, and just recently became CEO. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more what are the key factors to your tremendous success? Yeah, sure, Dana. And uh, actually, my past is not very common because uh, I'm not one of the original founders, and uh, I was an employee number 64 the first time I joined Reface and it was an internship even before I become a chief business officer. Uh, I just helped with the content, uh, content partnerships and then I rejoined the company uh, as a chief business officer and then I had this very good career progression. I think actually the, the, uh, there are a few factors, right? And uh, I would say the first one is obviously the culture of Reface and how it's built inside. Uh, definitely not in every organization this growth is possible. And I think in Reface, it's we make the company proactively the place where this kind of things can happen. Uh, so I, I would just say that, uh, I mean, everyone in the team is extremely supportive. That's very important, right? When you come, when you're new to a company, it already has its own vibe. You, you, you really need some support and uh, you need a lot of context to perform well. Uh, the second thing is we face also a, a team. We are a team of like-minded people and we treat each other as, we, we call it refations. There is even a special definition inside. So that's very, very helpful. And I think the most important piece of the culture here is that uh, at Reface, there are just so many different things you can do. And uh, even now, if someone comes to me and say, hey, Anton, how can I help? I mean, I can name at least 20 things that uh, needs to be fixed at Reface. And the great thing is that the company culture, the leadership, uh, everyone is in the company is super excited to allow people to take initiative, to take new projects, and then support them going through these projects. And I think that actually really helped me because when I joined the company, I realized that there are a few things that ideally needs to be fixed. And uh, there was no bureaucracy, no approval process, no kind of, okay, it's my territory, please don't do that. Uh, you just take it and do it. And if you execute well, you can grow really quickly this organization. And we have a few other examples where people joined uh, the company sort of line manager role, and now they're also in the leadership. So I think it's it, it's really good. And uh, I think, I mean, last but not the least, uh, also if to talk more about my experience, I think it was a really good match also in terms of what Reface used to be as a company and what skill set I bring to the table. Because back then, Reface was a technologically brilliant company with a lot of creative ideas, great products. But I think what it lacked back then is a sort of a strategy clarity, a little bit more structure, uh, analytical um, approach to work. And that's what I could have brought to the company, basically, uh, having it from my prior experience. So there was a really good match. I had an amazing ecosystem to grow. And then my skill set was very complementary to what Reface needed at that time. Yeah, that, that looks like you joined at the, to the right company at the right time with the right skill set, right? That was a perfect match for you. And that is amazing. But, you know, at the same time, becoming a CEO, co-CEO at the growing innovative tech company at the very turbulent times for, for the country where you're operating, it actually brings me, you know, the idea of peacetime CEO and wartime CEO. I believe you are familiar with these terms. Uh, it's Ben Horowitz in his book, Hard Things About the Hard Things. He actually had the whole section how CEOs actually work differently in dif different times. So do you believe that your skill set is actually craft like tailored well for the wartime in Ukraine where company operates? Uh, with the older human that, that that's a very interesting question and uh, i would maybe disagree here with uh, our investor uh, i think every person has sort of a natural way of doing things and also it relates to leadership as well like a natural style and also uh, 
obviously companies and the environment that shape them at this particular time needs sort sort of like this this leadership type or or the other one and a, a really good leader is able to change heads uh, I, I i still believe that i'm not quite there yet i obviously have my sort of natural style of doing things but i think it fits well the broader narrative where reface is at right now because uh, we are sort of distributed and very empowered in the way how we how we run things. So, for example, one of I mean, we believe like one of our competitive advantages, uh, the way how we build organization and the way that literally like the ideas come from where everywhere the company they are listened to and some are executed. So, for example, our most recent uh, app, which was also very very successful, we. Uh, the app is called Restyle, and it got uh, number seven place at the U.S. top store in May, which is a great success for us. Uh, it, it was, again, the idea from the content department, which went through. So I think uh, given the reface kind of uh, cultural setting, also our drive to innovate, and you know that in generative AI, there are like so many moving pieces. We cannot even, yeah. we a company of 190 people trying to follow everything that happened, and we also take part in it. We literally do not see even like 50% of what's going on. So I think what's important, and especially for, for us, it's a war time, it's a non-war time. It's just to be extremely agile, extremely flexible, uh, and obviously having a direction where we want to move, but also having a very sort of movable organization which can adjust very quickly. And it helped us survive the war time when it was organizationally very, very difficult, obviously. I mean, first things first, Everyone needs to be safe. Everyone needs to have enough time out of work to help themselves, relatives, friends, and stuff. And then the work comes as dessert. And we actually, as a company, proactively came in the first week of work to everyone at Reface. And they say, look, the first priority is you and your family. Second is if you have any volunteering projects, things, how you can help broader community, you do it. And then if you have time, you can contribute to Reface. Uh, so this sort of flexibility, it worked well for us during the war. So people had time actually to do things that are important for them and important for organization. Because me as a CEO, I don't really know how do we need to deal with all these millions of questions which arise super quickly. And also bringing it back to more like peaceful time, it's also super important to innovate, especially in the industry where we are. Uh, so it, I think it fitted well both periods. But again, I, I need to put a disclaimer that we are actually a very lucky company because 99.9% .9 of our business is outside of Ukraine. Uh, and therefore, we just need to deal with the things on back end. We don't have the demand problem, which many businesses, like, for example, e-commerce, Rosetka, and stuff like that, they face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand you. At the same time, you, but you are the whole, as you said, back end, right? The development and uh, is all in Ukraine, right? So probably you had to, to be very, as you said, flexible and uh, prioritize the right things for people. If you were pushing them to, you know, prioritize prioritize work over their family or their safety, that would probably not play well for the whole organization. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think one of the key things I, as a leader of any organization, the team, etc., you need to sort of have very clear like values, what's important to you and what's the level of their priority. Otherwise, you just uh, you can draw the decision making process every time you need to actually think from scratch. OK, how do I fit it in the ways I need to do? Uh, so it helped us as a company quite quite a bit. We didn't even think we just did it straight away when everything started. There was not even a single question sort of asked, like, should we do it or not? It was very clear. Got it. Yeah. So how different is your current role from the previous one? And what specifically are you looking forward to, like new strategies that you have in place, plans? So Yeah. yeah. So the, the first piece, how it's different. So my previous role uh, was named chief operating officer, and I was responsible for the commercial piece of the business, uh, basically our p &L and also sort of streamlining our strategy so it becomes execu executional, right? Mm -hmm. And now I also do a lot of similar things in terms of my scope of work. But uh, one thing that uh, changed dramatically is obviously the level of responsibility. It, I think it not increased by 50%, it increased 10x because now everything that happens in the company is your, your business. Mm -hmm. Every person who is struggles, you need to come and figure out how to help. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a huge uh, kind of tr tremendous uh, impact on everything you do. And the the second part is also, I think your scope uh, 
it sort of stays the same, but also other pieces that you were not extremely proficient at also adds up and you ended up being a person making the most important decisions and there's just the breadth of things you look is uh, exponentially higher. Uh, I think these are the, the, the key differences. And in terms of what what drives me, uh, I think all my life before Reface, I've been working with amazing companies from all over the world. Uh, so at Horizon, I work with the best companies in Ukraine. And then I also work for BCG, Boston Consulting Group. We also work with the best companies worldwide. Uh, I also went to Harvard to study for an MBA. And uh, then every day we also were exposed either to cases or to speakers or to companies to collaborate with, which are also top notch. Uh, and I think actually what helps me at the job is that I have a pretty good understanding what a good company is, what what features should it have, how it should run strategy, what the team should look like. So this sort of like a lot of things that I've seen help, helps quite a bit right now. And what I'm uh, super motivated is just uh, to build uh, an outstanding company uh, out of Reface from Ukraine. And I think we're already there, but I just want to expand it way more. So we want to become larger. We want to become even more profitable. We want to achieve a very sustainable path to growth. Very important part, which we also communicate on every company meeting is that for us, people is the core, just the way how we build the company. Therefore, we really want everyone has the room to grow. They are happy. We create psychological safety. Uh, so going back, I think running a business is also a very noble uh, noble job. And as a journalist, for example, crave for an amazing article and doctor want to heal someone. Uh, for me, I really want to create opportunities for other people through kind of bringing everyone together and building things. So people have jobs, it's interesting. They find friends at the jobs and stuff like that. So that's exactly what drives me, to create even bigger and more successful rephrase. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, that the, the you actually really care about the inside of the organization right because without people it's probably impossible to build such a outstanding product that reface is offering to the market without the talented and innovative people that you have in your team at the same time so you mentioned that you one of your plans is to become larger but how the size of the company correlates with its you know the, the success because you know like from my understanding, there are so many uh, outsourced businesses in Ukraine that directly depend on their size, right, with their kind of revenue level. Probably that is not your case since you are the, delivering the totally different product to the market. Yeah, yeah. So I think size is also a, a, a relative thing and you can also define size in many, many ways. It can be size of the number of employees. It can be the size of your revenue stream, okay. the number of products and stuff. For me, uh, when I say size, I think uh, what I mean is uh, is eventually the impact on the world you're making and also the size of the opportunities for people who work with you. So these things that drive us. Uh, I think we're not planning to become a 10,000 people company in the nearest future, obviously. But what we plan to do is just to launch even more amazing products that touch millions of users, that drive TikTok trends, that have an impact on the culture. Uh, we also want to be able to earn more, to invest more in innovations, uh, to, to keep our uh, research uh, world-class and stuff like that. Therefore, I think sizes and the impact, and we obviously target for impact. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, like really curious to know more about how do you keep up with all the trends that are out there in terms of content creation, since, you know, they change so fast and you you cannot be kind of lagging with your technology. You should be driving right in the driving seat for these trends. So what is your innovative way of thinking to be able to preserve your leading uh, position on the market? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. And I don't think we have a perfect answer to that. And we constantly think how we can be better at monitoring and even creating ourselves uh, social trends, which are very important for our business. A few practical things. Um, we recently created uh, an innovation department at Reface, which job is exactly uh, the job monitoring things, which technologies which come up to the market new machine learning papers will which we also discuss together with people from both engineering side and also from the content side 
we have uh, we have created a special department. It's called AI content within Reface. Mm-hmm. And uh, this department is actually a driver of innovation because they look, if the innovation funnel looks more about, okay, these are the business use cases. These are sort of things which potentially can be allowed by the technology. AI content takes it from the different approach and they look at, okay, what's interesting, how we can take a model, play with it in a way that we ended up with the consumer use case. So they they are more sort of consumer minded in a way and what they want to see, like whether, for example, for us, one of the KPIs is that every product needs to be emotionally engaged. Uh, so pe- it needs to drive feelings of the people. So they want to talk about it, share about it, share, share it and stuff like this. This is for us the, you know, like the, the quality, the quality check. Uh, and also we have a, a department of marketing, which also obviously tracks everything that happens on TikTok, which is now a very big, uh, obviously, platform where the culture happens right now. Uh, other social platforms. Um, and then obviously we collaborate with each other and basically the tech piece, the product piece, the content piece and the marketing slash user piece, they all come together and uh, in a structured way, we try to have a funnel very similar to actually a VC fund when we have an early stage ideas. And then we have a sort of way to validating this idea. So it ends up in the product where we have a pretty high confidence that it's going to succeed based on the multiple things that we checked beforehand. I really love how you actually approach the idea validation and what are your KPIs, right? The emotional component of your solutions, right? So this is a fascinating uh, way of... uh, Proof uh, your concept that and ideas that you're going to launch. And recently, you know, I, I've been following you on LinkedIn and I saw your post about launching um, Unboring, a web uh, content creation platform. First thing that caught my attention is Unboring because, you know, there is a boring company from Elon Musk. So maybe you can tell me why Unboring. And another, and the other question is, so how different is your platform to other web content creation platforms in terms of features or capabilities? Yeah, thank you very much, Donna, for the question. So Unboring is our most recent release, and we've released a few things this year, and a few are still coming, but this is the most fresh one. Um, so uh, our mission of the company is to empower everyone to create amazing content. Uh, because we believe that everyone is a creator inside and reface and reface products is basically a shortcut to creativity. A lot of people want to create, but sometimes they don't have tools. And why just not give people the tools to create more great things and entertain themselves and their friends? And when you think about this mission and look at the product portfolio of Preface back then, let's say a year ago, we used to have one app, actually two. We launched the second one, which was big enough, but still. Um, and if you want to push forward within this mission, you start thinking, okay, maybe I want to add more products. Maybe I want to expand to new geographies, or maybe I want to also embrace new platforms. And in our case, Unboring is is sort of our entrance into another very big distribution platform, which is web, right? So we are a big player in mobile. We never tried web, but many things that we do for mobile, they are also super relevant for web. And therefore, we just sort of one of the logic is just to expand the distribution, right? And uh, it, it sounds pretty pretty logical. Uh, the second point is that um, web is the place where you can uh, arguably easier. Uh, it's easier to launch new things. It's faster because it's less for mobile development and stuff like that. And therefore, strategically, we also think about our web platform as the sandbox where we can test very quickly other things that we want to also build uh, mobile products out of it. Uh, it would be, for example, a much easier to bring in new machine learning mechanics in the web than in mobile and test it out. So strategically, it's also very important. And last but not the least, um, I think one of the things that we focus at Reface is that we work with easy to use use cases. That's also a piece of the strategy because there are companies that take one use case and they make them super deep or extremely complex, high quality. You can do many iterations and stuff like this. We go different route. So we simplify technologies, we simplify use cases so everyone in the world can use them. And actually it helps reface products, hit millions of users, top stores and stuff like that. But the problem with that is once you find a thing which you really like, for example, Restyle, our new app with video to video technology, it's amazing for TikTok creators because you can take a video and you can 
make out of it a cartoon, a Shrek universe or something else. But then you're limited by the easy to use use case because you always have trade-offs. Uh, you can add more editing features, but then the use case is not easy to use anymore and you cannot scale it to everyone in the world. Uh, and therefore in our mobile products, we still stay kind of true to our original mission of easy to use. But web is the way how we can sort of upsell, upgrade the creator experience. And a very easy use case is basically you're a TikTok creator and on the mobile, you can only do 10 seconds video to video snippets. And for example, you have something that you also need to edit the video length a bit. You can add a bit more features. You also have other web applications which you use for your editing. So web tool is just basically the next step of creativity, which opens you up more opportunities. And therefore for us, it's sort of, Kind of increasing like lengthening the user journey of people who come with mobile and then end up with more professional semi-professional i would say experience on the web that is a very interesting concept and the expansion of your business at the same time do you feel that it actually adds up more complexity to your business since you were primarily focused only on mobile users now you have also to manage and monetize the web platform users Oh, yeah, it's a very good question. And it definitely does. It definitely does. So the more things we do, uh, the more complexity we have, obviously. Uh, and uh, we we try to proactively address that. We, we try to simplify things, uh, which basically the foundation of everything we build, the tech stack, backend, machine learning, engineering, ops, prod, and stuff like that. So complexity is definitely there. Uh, but also the, the benefit of size is there. Uh, the more the more things you have, the more also capabilities you can allow yourself to have and build. I think a very uh, like a case in point, a really good uh, a, a really good story is that uh, original Reface app was built a sort of on we called it old rails of machine learning production, and what it means is that it was a a very big sort of an ar artifact of code which was efficient and it worked well with Reface, but it was impossible to plug other mechanics. So we need to build sort of new machine learning ops infrastructure for the other products. And we invested quite a bit of time to kind of untangling everything and simplifying the base. So every other product can be tucked into the system. And it's not possible if you have just one product, you don't do it. If you have multiple, you actually do it. And then you share the benefit across okay. all other things. Therefore, we understand the complexity. We try to manage it. But also when we do things, we, we think about synergies and other benefits that size uh, and sort of the breadth of things we do can bring to us. Anton, you, you uh, quite often you mention uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and these technologies, they are on a huge trend right now, right? But I know that Reface has been using ML and AI since the inception of the company. Uh, in one of your interviews, you said that uh, we when we launched the company, the company was launched, we didn't have the idea, but we had the technology in place. And in another uh, interview, you said that you the company is more advanced in terms of tech than the product-wise, meaning that you are still looking for the ways to apply all the knowledge that you have managed to collect in the organization to, to the products that you will eventually launch. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about this, uh, you know, the trends and how did you manage uh, out of Ukraine to create this, uh, you know, to be on top of the trends, AI and machine learning trends? Uh, so, yeah, uh, going back to Reface's history, I think it was not also very uh, typical in the way that the first there was tech and then the second there was a use case in the product. Because usually, according to the most conventional wisdom, you try to search for a problem and then around the problem, you try to envision the product and then you work on the tech side to make it possible. Uh, but uh, the conventional wisdom is there because it makes sense. Therefore, we obviously strengthened our product expertise, uh, user research and stuff like that. So we are not only strong on the tech side, but also on the user side. And I think uh, it, our work really well manifested in the, uh, the number of new products we launched. So we launched Revive a, a year ago, which is an extremely successful product for us. It's a face animation. Um, it's actually a very significant part of Reface, Reface as a business uh, uh, metrics and engagement. We also launched uh, 
avatars, we launched image to image technology within Restyle, we launched video to video, now we, we launched onboarding. So this, all of the things which also stem from what users need and the conventional wisdom of how you do products. But also at the same time, we completely understand and embrace that sometimes the technologies give you an ideas of what you want to, to build. Because sure. people have problems uh, and sometimes they don't even understand whether they have problems and they cannot even envision until you bring them the solution. And the, the tech is another way of brainstorming and generating things. So we still look at tech. We have like everyone, uh, not everyone, but like we have dedicated people in the company who look every day at the new machine learning models, which were posted open source or not open source. So this is basically the job description of a few people uh, in the company. So that's very important. That's one of the ways how we monitor. Uh, we obviously uh, look what other companies do in our space. That's also a great insight. Um, especially we are very excited if something gets traction, which means that, okay, we can skip the validation part and try potentially to do something better. Uh, but also the important piece is, um, I mean, friendships, uh, networking, uh, chatting with the people who also work in this industry. Uh, because in the end of the day, I think, um, honestly, competition is overrated. I don't think that, I think people think too much about competition. They think too little about the ways how to grow pie together. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very evident, like there's so many people that build amazing businesses on partnerships. They, they have an idea, and don't, they do not close. They actually seek others to exploit this idea. And instead of, dividing a very small pie they all work on a growing pie uh therefore yeah i think the collaboration chats uh, conferences with others in the industry is super helpful also kind of to frame yourself what you need to do can you talk about the recent partnership that you got with within the reface with other players so we we work on a few uh, partnerships we still do not disclose until there is some substance that we can definitely share but uh I mean, not very related to tech, but also a very good case in point and partnership is how actually quite a lot of new fashion brands appear. They just started collaborating with the others who have a little bit more weight, but do not have that brevity to explore certain things. And then these collaborations actually bring value to both of the parties. Uh, the same way you can approach it in technically every business and here specifically because the speed is so high and uh, it's a bit crazy to do always things uh, yourself. Uh, but yeah, sorry for not giving you too much details, but I hope That's okay. I the frame understand. is quite clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is clear. Yeah, great, Anton. So another topic that I really want to talk about that is so dear to my heart, being a, Ukraine, a Ukrainian, right, that had to leave the country when the war started, so uh, tell me more about this. Uh, that so we all can see that the company that Reface operates at its maximum capacity, launching new products, new platforms, right? That actually are stunning in their quality, right? And the value that they provide to the uh, users. Tell me how has this full scale war against Ukraine impacted Reface and your strategy for growth and uh, launching new products? Uh, sure, sure. I think I can divide this piece into th three components, how it uh, impacted organization, then the second morale, and then the third, the strategy and basically where we're going. So we'll start with the easy one, uh, the strategy of where we're going. Uh, the war did not impact us at all. Uh, I think all of the changes uh, to strategy were more uh, driven by other factors external opportunities things we've built things we've come up internally and stuff like that so again as i as i said we're quite lucky that our top line was not affected by the war uh, and it's not true unfortunately for everyone in ukraine so strategy wise is fine uh, on the organizational side uh, obviously at the beginning it was extremely hard to balance all things uh, safety of employees, safety of our own servers, uh, properties, and stuff like that. We also did a very bold move at the beginning of the war, uh, basically using all installed refaces on the Russian phones in Russia to, to send uh, pictures of the war, uh, basically using reface as a means to communicate to a broader Russian population, which, as we know, obviously didn't work, uh, but it was our move how we can potentially help things uh, go 
going through. And what we saw afterwards is that Russia started proactively attacking Reface. They're trying right. to penetrate uh, our our different things and stuff like that. Uh, so there is a very big security piece as well. Um, and even now, obviously, we uh, like there are alarms, missile alarms. People cannot work. Everyone is stressed. Uh, it's very hard to sleep at night. So we we try to adjust these things. We try to create comfortable environment for people. Uh, we we have hotels in the western part of the country where people just can stop by for whatever they want and just stay there, work there, or just chill there. So they have this opportunity to kind of mix places and stuff like that. So organizational piece was very big, and uh, there are a few amazing people at Reface who actually uh, managed to make it operational in, in, in the way and that we still operate at full capacity. And the third aspect, which I really wanted to touch is the morale. And uh, I would say that um, actually my observation is that people became even more driven and dedicated at Reface after the war started. Uh, I think uh, now for a lot of people, it's actually important to understand their help and contribution to the broader thing which is happening. Because obviously war is number one thing everyone thinks about. And also at Reface, if you ask me what's my number one dream, is that we win the war, we finish it, and uh, we, we start living the way we want to live, not even making Reface a great company. I think it's the same for, for, a, lot of, uh, for a lot of people. And therefore, people started finding even more purpose of working at Reface because we are a company which is fighting on the economic front of the country, uh, if to say, right? We are one of the anchor tech companies from Ukraine. We are the ones who drives the innovation. We are the ones also who speak on behalf of many Ukrainians on the events, court uh, uh, conferences, sometimes in the articles. Uh, and it drives everyone. I think we have all united against one enemy and it really helps uh, to bring the morale up. Uh, and yeah, I constantly hear from people that actually they're very thankful that the pace of free phase is now very high. We do a lot of things and it helps them live through these difficult times. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, your answer actually brings up a lot of questions for me, right? But, you know, key strategies for startups and businesses uh, in order to stay resilient. In your article that was titled, What I've Learned uh, from Running a Startup Company in Ukraine During the War, you mentioned three key strategies for any startup company, startup business that want to remain resilient. And you talked about what you have just mentioned, right? Like selection of aim, maintaining the morale, and it's probably morale of the entire organization, right? Just to make sure that people are supported, right? People know that they have the, uh, their place to work and also about the flexibility. How can this translate to other businesses that do not operate in these kind of extreme uh, conditions as Reface uh, being located in Ukraine? How this uh, strategy for and three pillars of resilience can translate to other businesses? Yeah, I think it's actually super, super transferable. And the, the way how I link it is that it, Basically, everything goes back to psych psychology and what, what motivates people. And I think the same actually things motivate people at war, at the peacetime. Uh, and one of very big things which I believe in is uh, to have people's, the ability of people to have autonomy of doing actually meaningful things. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you as a business leader, what you need to do is set an objective, objective which is reachable. You sort of understand how to how to get there. You have some strategic pillars that you want to strategically invest, hire, and stuff like that. But eventually, you people do not want to know that oh, you need to build this and that feature. Please go and show me in two months. They are much more empowered if you tell them, look, we think that this area is a place where a new uh, Reface app can appear because of this, that, and that reason. This is our hypothesis. Go and figure it out with your team. And this is exactly what drives people, right? They feel ownership. They feel that, okay, this is my piece and I, I, I need to crush. I have a frame, so I'm not boiling the ocean. I don't need to invent something or just, you know, like try hundreds of different things. I have a frame, but then it's full my responsibility and my autonomy to, to build stuff. Uh, and I think it actually goes back to to the article that I've written that the 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 aim, the objective is very, very important, but also it's very, very important not not to push too hard and go from the objective also to the complete things that you need to deliver to need to achieve. 
because it actually kills motivation. And then obviously, in order to do that, you need to keep helping people, empowering them, chatting with them, bringing them context, which goes back to maintaining morale and also explaining why this goal that you've set is actually important and not only important in sort of your numbers way, but also had a broader kind of story around it. And obviously flexibility. Everyone needs to wants to be flexible. They want to do their own things. And uh, I think as a leader and a manager, you really need to be humble and understand that everyone is in your company knows about something way more than you do. And you need to be totally comfortable with that. Um, so yeah, I think these principles actually apply. I apply quite, quite a bit everywhere. I really like the sense of ownership of the task where you not just throw tasks at people without explaining the broader context and how it's going to impact the company, right? And their work, which actually makes people even be more proactive, more motivated to achieve uh, the goals they've been uh, given. Yeah, that is uh, fascinating. Um, I know that, you know, like while many people were stressed, the war started, it disrupted the way uh, people used to work. You found yourself uh, capable of uh, setting up fund, right? Reface fund uh, that in just two months been able to raise around 200K to support Ukrainian civilians and army. Can you tell me more about uh, your motivation? It's probably clear right? you, you could see the, the need in the society, right? There is a constant need for funds and to uh, support people. At the same time, you know, it's a huge sum of money, which uh, you would not be able to raise unless you got the trust from people who donate, right? So what does this kind of level of support tell you about Reface and yourself as a tech leader of the company? Yeah, I think I think a few things. So first, uh, I mean, obviously the motivation is very clear. The beginning of the war, no one knows what to do. Uh, you, you want to do everything at once. Uh, we all, I think, you, you also remember really well that you have twenty four hours. You do not sleep. You just try to do hundreds of things, and uh, there was a pure motivation to help. Um, but actually, what's interesting is that uh, going back to reface this culture of initiatives, it can grow into bigger projects inside. It was also very quickly picked up by Reface uh, Finance and legal teams who can set up like a proper fund. Uh, and it grew into a bigger initiative that I originally thought about. Uh, so I think it's a very indicative of the way how we work. Uh, the other piece is that we also received quite a bit of funding from uh, our friends abroad. Uh, our investors, for example, David Helgeson is our co-founder of uh, Unity, Ilkat, co-founder of Supercell, Adam Leber. Um, who runs um, Justin Bieber business and stuff, they also contributed to this fund. Uh, and I think uh, one of the reasons why is that because uh, man Reface managed to build uh, a pretty solid brand worldwide. And I think solid in the way that uh, people know about it. So it's it's not like a bleak uh, black and white brand. It's the brand that stands for something. And uh, I think kind of gets the emotions out of people. And second, also, Reface has been also very, very diligent in the way how we handled different risks posed by AI. Uh, straight from the beginning, we were part of multiple initiatives to kind of regulate and uh, create frameworks, how AI needs to develop and stuff like that. And it also builds trust in the way that, okay, this company is actually also socially responsible. And I would assume that it increased our capacity to uh, to fundraise. And now, obviously, once uh, we are more than a year into the war, a lot of things have stabilized and there are people who do this job way better than us. And therefore, Reface Fund is not as active as it used to be at the beginning. But again, we find our purpose now in other things like providing people with the job, with the growth, with uh, interesting ideas to work on. Uh, so we focus basically more on this uh, business front. Yeah, and I think that, you know, uh, since you are still operating and you are not closing any of your offices, and as you said, right, you, by being active, like hiring people, providing them with jobs, you are contributing to Ukrainian economy, which is a huge thing in times of war. So uh, kudos to that. Um, Anton, you, you touched on um, AI regulations, right? And uh, 
that is a very hot debate right now. And there are so many initiatives about how do we use artificial intelligence responsibly. Can you just maybe briefly tell me your position at your company? How So what is your take on that? And how can companies use that incredible technology for the benefit of everyone? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in general, I think AI is an amazing thing, uh, which which has obviously more benefits than the potential threats. And uh, again, we can talk a lot about it, but that's uh, a huge productivity boost to the economy. Uh, a lot of potentially new high value jobs created. People will be able to focus more on high value added things, and the others would be able to outsource to AI. But then again, threats are also very, very evident, right? From the spreading misinformation to actually helping others cheat other people, right? Or or do other uh, other bad things. Uh, so regulation is a necessary thing in any industry, I believe, because uh, the capitalism is great. It works perfect, but it works until there are boundaries to it, right? So it, it's an important piece. Uh, the problem with AI is that I think we have never seen this rapid pace of innovation. And uh, historically, regulation has been quite slow addressing multiple things. And here, the speed is even higher. So there is a very big risk of actually mishandling the regulation part. And also, we see that in different countries, regulators are also trying to be very quick. But I think the difference between, like the philosophical difference between the regulator and the business in a way that uh, business is very, very easy, right? You create a value in your niche, you create something that some people use, and then you can go and do something else. For the regulation, you actually need to think about the profound effects on everyone and also in the long term. So it's inherently different type of work that you need to do. It requires more time, more experience, more cases and stuff like that. And therefore, what we're seeing now is that Governments try to impose the frameworks, but at the same time, are these frameworks good enough or not? And uh, here, I think uh, the best way forward is sort of to collaborate with the businesses to find a really, really good way how it how it can it can work, right? So, for example, one of very interesting uh, thoughts that I recently heard from my colleagues is that um, regulation also usually benefits big companies. Okay. Uh, because big companies have enough lawyers, they have enough infrastructure to address things. And what it means is that if you favor big companies right at the beginning of a new technological boom, there is a very high risk to end up with a big gatekeepers who control everything. And I think it's not the way we want to build AI ecosystem just for the safety of it, right? It's the same as you always have the same president. It leads to very bad consistencies. Therefore, you also want to have a big working sort of infrastructure or ecosystem where different companies may be successful, but no one dominates. And I think that's one of the really big risks that we currently face, that if there is too much regulation, we can end up in the situation where only Googles of the world can maintain the business within these guidelines and the rest would just not be able to compete. And it would be very bad. Yeah, yeah, totally understand. Yeah, I've been following lots of these discussions and, uh, you know, like regulation, pro-regulation, against regulation. Some, uh, you know, executives who see this as a threat to stop innovation that, uh, you know, somebody is trying to impose others, see and share your opinion where it's more anti-monopoly, where we can uh, distribute the pie more or less equally to benefit everyone, every player uh, right out there, which is interesting. My last question to you, Anton, is I'd like to, you know, since you are Ukrainian, you are running a Ukrainian um, extremely innovative uh, company, right? What would, what kind of message would you like to share with your business community regarding Ukraine as the promised land of innovation and technology advances? investments yeah that's that's very interesting question uh here i think i would come up with uh analogy uh so a typical person who ends up building microsoft's of the world google google's of the world is the person who is basically swimming against the current not having funding sitting in the garage alone trying to hack something Many things do not work. Uh, He tries again and again and again for many, many years. And then in the end, you have an amazing corporation, which is obviously like mind-blowing, right? And uh, 
going back to innovation tech uh, tech scene and startups i think people who succeed are those who actually go through different different barriers the different problems and uh, they ended up winning right because there it, building tech companies it's a very hard and sometimes very upsetting experience until you reach that point and here you can actually provide an analogy to ukraine ukraine and ukrainians is the country who constantly struggles right we have a lot of internal enemies such as corruption weak uh, institutions and stuff like that now we obviously at war with the country which is 14 times bigger in terms of economy than ukraine and we still manage to crush them and uh uh and we're doing amazingly well on the battlefield right uh therefore uh, just this analogy uh will allow people to understand that Ukraine actually looks like a typical startup founder who ended up having an amazing company. It's resilient, it's innovative just because it has not enough resources. Uh, the circumstances are actually quite hard, so you need to invent new new approaches to work and uh, you never give up. Uh, therefore, yeah, I, I feel like Ukraine is a strike example and uh, I have no, no doubts that we're going to succeed as a country big time and we already see a lot of companies, a lot of amazing talent in other different companies running departments, innovation labs and stuff. We just need to crush Russians, which is going to happen for sure. And uh, afterwards, I mean, eventually we'll become extremely successful, no doubt. Thank you. Thank you for this very positive, uh, you know, um, answer. And I really love the analogy between Ukraine and the startup businesses, right? Where we know that startups can suffer uh, from a lot of things, right? But eventually, if they persist, right, they they may achieve uh, great outcomes. Anton, thank you so much for this uh, great interview and for sharing all your insights and knowledge. It's been a great pleasure to have you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you very much for having me.